All right, all right, Agape City, how you doing on a Sunday morning? A lot of Michigan State fans in the room, huh? Yeah. It was rough. It was rough. Uh, bless your heart. I hear you guys are trying. Anyway, um, that's it. I promise you that's the last Michigan State joke. Everything else will be pointed towards Ohio, I promise. Um, so, uh, so glad you're here today. Today we're in the fourth week of a series that we have called Take Back Your Life. If this is your first time at Agape City, let me introduce myself. My name's Brad. I'm the lead pastor of this church. And um, this whole month we've been on this journey uh, talking about this topic, taking back our life. A lot of the content of this sermon comes from a book written by a pastor named Levi Lusco. And, uh, and so you can get that book if you want to read it and get more information on it. But, um, but the series, what we were talking about is, is this truth. Um, Jesus tells us in John chapter 10, verse 10, that, that God wants us, he, Jesus came to this earth so that we may have life and life to the full. But in that same verse, Jesus tells us that there is opposition to that, that there is an enemy named the devil, and the devil wants nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy. So God gave you life and life to the full. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy that. And what we've been talking about over the course of these four weeks is how can we take back our life that was given to us by God? And how could, and it's supposed to be life, and it's supposed to be good, and it's supposed to be to the full. And if that got stolen away from us, what can we do to take it back? Because we're not helpless victims in this battle. We have the Holy Spirit of God in us. And we can stand up against the evil one. We can stand up against opposition. And we can take agency into our own life. And we could take back what God has already given us through Jesus. Life and life to the full. So that's what this whole series has been about. Uh, the first week, if you remember, we talked about the idea of just waking up to that truth, like the wake-up call to what's going on and, and being aware of that. The second week, we talked about focusing and, and what you focus on really matters and focusing on the right thing. Last week, I, I was here and we talked about this idea of, of hold that thought, like that transformation, the, 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 the act of taking it back. It doesn't really start with force. It starts with thinking. And the way that we think literally transforms what we do. And if you missed any of those weeks, you can go back and you can check in on those and read up on those. Uh, but today, what I want to talk about with my time, as we are considering what it looks like to take our life back, is I want to talk about what do you do when a king passes by? Or maybe this way, what do you do when you think you know the right thing to do? So that's what we're going to be talking about for our time today. Um, if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your phone, you're always going to get the most out of these messages if you follow along in your Bible or on your Bible app. So we're going to be in one chapter of the Bible today, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to read the entire chapter this morning. And some of you are like, Brad, oh, an entire chapter of the Bible? Calm down. You binge watch all of Lord of the Rings last week, okay? You can... You'll manage, okay? I promise you, you will. Um, but we're going to read this entire chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 6. And uh, while you're turning to 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, let me just kind of set the stage by making this statement. Um, ants have nothing to do with yellow fever or malaria. You're like, yeah, we know that. Ants have nothing to do with the spread of yellow fever or malaria. But you know what's interesting? At the turn of uh, the 20th century, right, when it's coming into the 20th century, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, the people of the United States of America, we had the gold rush going out west, you know, the 49ers, and, and, and people were on the west coast of America, and they were getting all these resources and all these rich, you know, uh, you know gold and, and riches and all of these things, and they wanted to send it back to the east side of America uh, to, you know, you know, put it back in their homesteads and these type of things, but they, the, the journey across America was so long, and so they, they thought it was easier to put the, the materials on a ship and then take the ship around. But to go all the way around the tip of South America, the 8,000 mile journey was so cumbersome and it took so long that it was the French first and then the Americans took it over because we often have to for the French. Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, it was the French first who got this idea that right in between, between North and South America, there's this little isthmus, this little thin piece of land. It's only about 50 miles across, a little less than 50 miles across. And they said, you know what? If we dig a canal through here, we, can, we get to get all these resources to the other side of the country way faster. 
So that's how the, the process of the Panama Canal began. It was late 1800s, and, and the French started, and the French's idea, we're just going to dig straight through. We're just, like, just going to just dig it straight through. And so they started doing that and go, working towards that, but what happened was they started to experience casualties. Now, I mean, the work environment was hostile, to say the least. I mean, they're in the middle of an active rainforest. And, and, and so the heat, the moisture, the, the, everything that's happening, the, 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 the bugs, the snakes, the venom, everything. And, and then the French's idea was, well, we're just going to dig straight through this. So they tried for, for years, decades, they just tried digging through this. And it got to the point where they were, they were, they were hitting this roadblock. And so they said, we, we don't know what we're going to do. And then Americans said, well, we'll come in and take it over, but we're not going to dig through. We're going to build this lock system to get across. All I have to say is this. While they were building, people started to get sick. Like I said, there were so many casualties. A lot of the casualties were from accidents and slipping and falling and getting hurt by machinery. But increasingly, more and more people were going to an infirmary not because they got hurt, because they were getting sick with yellow fever and malaria. And then people who were in the infirmary, who, who were not even, you know, uh, you know, who were there because of an injury, a physical injury, they started to get yellow fever and malaria in the infirmary. And so they were like, what is going on? What is happening? Why is everybody getting sick? And the only thing they knew, the only thing they knew was people kept getting bit by these ants. These giant ants were everywhere and they kept biting the people. And so they said, well, you know what? I think these ants are transmitting yellow fever and malaria. So we need to do something about these ants. So their genius idea, like this is unbelievable. Their genius idea was this. On all the areas where we're working, every tree that's in the areas where we are working, what we don't want are ants climbing up that tree and then dropping down on us and then biting us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to dig little moats around every single tree and we're going to fill them with water. So that way ants can't crawl to the tree to get up the tree to fall on us. And that way it'll keep us safe from these ants getting on us. And for these people in the infirmary, you know, they're going in with injuries, but they're still getting yellow fever and malaria. I'm like, oh man. So we got to protect them from the ants as well. So this was their genius idea. So we're going to take all these hospital beds and we're going to put the legs of the beds in bowls of water. <laughs> One under each leg of the bed. So that way the ant can't crawl up the bed leg and, and crawl in the bed and bite you. And so we're going to be able to protect people from ants. Ants have nothing to do with the spread of yellow fever or malaria. Guess what does? Mosquitoes. And guess what mosquitoes love? They love pools of stagnant water. They literally, they literally thought we want to save lives. They thought the best way to save lives is to dig these moats and put these bowls of water and put all this water everywhere so that the ants won't get to people. And by doing so, it was the leadership. It was them who led more people to their death than had to die. They saw a problem and they had a good heart. They wanted to fix it. They saw a solution that they thought was reasonable and they went all in for that solution but it was their, their actions that caused more death and carnage. Ants have nothing to do with the spread of malaria and yellow fever. I say all that to say this. What we're going to read here in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, I believe is an account just like that. And I believe what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that we're going to read this morning, I believe it still happens today in the year 2023. I think you and I are sitting in a church service because our heart is to see the kingdom of God grow. Our heart is to see more people get to heaven. Our heart is to you know, see people not die to their sin, but to, to, to come alive in Christ. The question is, what are we doing? And are we doing the right thing the right way? Because if we get this middle part wrong, even though our heart is to do good, we could be a church that's actually harming people and actually leading people away from God, not closer to God. 
So let's walk through this chapter together, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Let me show you how this plays out in this chapter. Um, to make sure we're all on the same page here, 2 Samuel chapter 6, um, we're in a point of history uh, where Israel is into their second king. You, if you're taking notes, you, you should know this. If you're a follower of Jesus, we all need to know the first three kings of Israel. You don't have to memorize all of them. There's a bunch of them. It's hard to memorize. The first three you should have on lock, okay? Saul was the first king of Israel. David is the second king, and then David's son, Saul. Solomon is the third king. Saul, David, and Solomon are the first three kings of Israel, and you should know that. David is the king at this point, and, uh, and, and David uh, has this idea, and it's a good idea. It's a good idea with a good heart for a good motive. David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David. And the city of David is Jerusalem. Just as you're reading scripture, just know that the city of David essentially is Jerusalem. It's like literally like right next to it, but it, it's like it is Jerusalem. And so as, as David is kind of, you know, um, building his kingdom up and, and, and into the promised land, and, and then God says, hey, I, I want you to take this ark and bring it into your city. And this is where we'll pick up. Second Samuel chapter six, look what it says in verse one and two. It says this, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. And he had all of them, and, and, and all of his men went to Bela and Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. Pause. Let me make sure we all know exactly what's going on, because this is a big deal. The Ark of the Covenant of God is important. If you've seen Raiders of the Lost Arks, you know that. Face-meltingly important, okay? Um, if you don't know what the Ark of the Covenant is, let me show you a picture of it. This is a picture of it right here. Um, this is not like a you know, real picture of it. We don't have it. We, never did, no, we don't have a picture of it. But what we have in Scripture is a detailed explanation of how it is to be made and what it is to look like. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, it's, it's essentially a box. Uh, that on top with the angels on it, that's a lid. And, um, and, and it's a, basically, it's a box with these poles that you're supposed to use to carry it. What's, the box itself, the structure itself, is not what's really important about the Ark. What's really important about the Ark is what is in it. What is in the Ark of the Covenant is three things. Um, where it comes from is the Exodus, when Moses was leading the God's people out of Egypt and leading them out of slavery towards a promised land, God said, I will be with you. Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. I am your God and you are my people. That is a covenant I made with Abraham and I am going to fulfill that covenant with you. That's why it's called the Ark of the Covenant. It's the covenant of Abraham. And, then, and God says, and so you know that I am with you. And Moses, I'm going to give you these experiences and I want you to put these experiences in this ark. First thing you're going to do is this. Go on top of this mountain, Mount Sinai, and I am going to give you my Ten Commandments, and I'm going to give you all my law as well. But these Ten Commandments, we're going to write them down on this tablet. And, and those tablets, I want you to you know, place those tablets, and Moses is going to break one. But still, the tablets are in the Ark of the Covenant. So the actual tablets from, from the, the Mount Sinai, from the Ten Commandments, they're in the Ark of the Covenant. And then while the nation of Israel is in the, in, in the wilderness and they're wandering around, God's sustaining them and he's giving them manna. And, and manna is this weird kind of substance that is essentially food, but it's from heaven and it's odd and it's like this flaky kind of stuff. It's like, it's like instant mashed potatoes. That's what I think of when, you, when I think of manna. It's like just the flaky instant mashed potatoes, like, mm, delicious. Anyway, um, and he says, I want you to take some of that show bread, some of that manna. I want you to put some of that in the ark as well. And then all through the Exodus, when the people were leaving Egypt and going towards the promised land, it was God himself who led them. We always say Moses led them. No, no, no. God himself led them by a pillar of fire in the day and a pillar of, a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of smoke during the day. It was God leading the nation where to go. Moses was following and trying to get everybody else to stay focused on the, the pillars. And so then God said, and then my presence my presence, the presence that led you out of slavery, that led you into this promised land, that it will be into that will be in the box as well. So the Ark of the Covenant is the, the Ten Commandments, it's the showbread, and it is the presence of God. The Spirit of God is there. See, in, 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 in Hebrew culture, they didn't think of God like he's everywhere and he's in my heart. No, 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 no. God's in a place. And that place is the Ark of the Covenant. And as the Israelites were moving through the wilderness, they, 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 they literally took their church with them. 
The first worship center, the first place of worship is called the tabernacle, and it's a portable church. It's a tent system that they would put up, and they would bring the Ark of the Covenant into it, and they put it in the center, and they would go there, and they would worship, and then when they were trying to leave, they'd tear it all down, and they'd walk on to the next place, and they would set it all back up, and they'd put the Ark of the Covenant back in there, and they would worship. And so this is what the, century, uh, this is what the people of, of, of God have been doing for decades now, going through the wilderness. And David is like, hey, that Ark, we're going to stop building these tabernacles and put them up and down. I'm going to build a temple in my city in Jerusalem. And in this temple, we're going to place this ark once and for all. We're going, to give, we're going to give God a permanent home where he's going to be. So that's what's happening here. David wants to bring the ark to the city of David. Now, verse 3 and 4 is where it gets real hairy. Look what happens next. It says, then they, then they, set, uh, they set the ark of God, look at this, on a new cart. And they brought it from the house of Abinadad, which, is on the, which was on a hill. Uzzah and Ahio. First off, let me just say this. It's Ahio, not Ohio. Okay? Ahio does the will of our Lord. Ohio does not. <laughs> We're friends of Ahio in this church, okay? A-H. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's the closest you're ever going to get with me. All right. Um, Ahio, so uh, Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadad, were, were, uh, were guarding, look at the, were guiding, well, look at this, guiding the new cart with the ark on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it, and David and the Israelites uh, were celebrating with, uh, with all their might before the Lord. All right, so what we see is the ark is being brought to the city of David. Notice, when you read scripture, when something is repeated, it's usually important. When something is repeated, it's usually important. They set the ark of God where? On a new cart. And they brought it to the house. Da, 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 da. And they were guiding it on what? A new cart. This is why this is important. Because what's about to happen next is going to seem way out of pocket. It's going to seem way over the top if we don't understand this. What's about to happen next is going to really frustrate God. And what God's mad about is not specifically really what happens next. What he's mad about is what's happening here. They're transporting the ark. They, want, they, want a, they have a good heart. We want the ark of the covenant in Jerusalem. That's a good thing to want. And then David says, and I want to do it the best way I know how. So I'm going to build a, I'm going to put it on rims. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going to put it on this cart. I'm just going to look, I'm, 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 it's going to be plush, plush. It's going to be a new one. It's going to be nice. I'm going I'm to get a new cattle. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to glide into the city. It's going to be nice. David had a good idea. He had a good heart. But the problem is this. God was very clear of how you're supposed to transport the ark. If you're taking notes, write this down. Exodus chapter 25, verse 14. Exodus 25, 14. In Exodus 25, God gives specific directions of how the ark is to be built. He gives specific direction how the ark is to be interacted with. And in, in verse 14, sec, uh, in, in verse 14, Exodus 25, verse 14, God gives specific instructions of how the ark is to be transported. You're supposed to use two poles held by four people, not just any people priests from the, the line of Levi, and that is how they are supposed to carry the ark everywhere it goes. David said, well, but God, you deserve more than that, more than people just carrying it, and it's going to take a long time, and it's not going to be, let me give you a cart. Let me do it my way. When a good heart done the wrong way, what you need to see is that could lead to destruction. So this ark, which is supposed to be carried, is now on a cart. And that cart is, is moving along. And look what happens in verse 6. It says, when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because of the oxen stumbled. And then look what happens. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down. And he died there beside the ark 
of God. Seems like an overreaction, doesn't it? It's on a cart. It's going down the hill. It's getting wobbly. It's tipping over. Us is doing a good thing. Whoa, don't fall. But the problem is the, cart, the ark never should have been on the cart in the first place. And you're never supposed to touch the box of the ark. You're only allowed to touch the poles of the ark. So, so even though they have a good heart for what they're doing, they think they're doing it in a righteous way, but they're doing it in a way that, that not, God did not ask them to do it. And then what's happening is well, now they are in peril. They are putting themselves in jeopardy. And so they, because they are irreverent to God. And so then Uzzah dies. And, and, and he dies, you know, not just because like it, it was an accident. He, he died from decisions that was made way before this. Decisions to do things our way, not God's way. Decisions for us to be crafty, not faithful. Decisions for us to, to think that God needs us to make him comfortable, to make him strong, to make him visible, to make him popular. God's like, stop disrespecting me. I told you exactly how to transport me. Do what I say. And I'm like, but God, we're trying to give you more. I don't need more. I'm God. What I want is obedience. If your heart is to honor me, then just do what I simply ask you to do, and then you will see the life that comes out of it. And you will know that came from me, not you, and I will get the glory and not you. But what happens in churches today, what happened to David here, is we have good hearts. We want to worship the Lord. We want to see his kingdom come. We want to see life saved. But sometimes we start to do it our way. Our way with more entertainment and more comfort and more, you know, giveaways and handouts and, and, and our way. But we want to join, the, we want to grow the kingdom. And so, but we do all this circus show and work so hard so that we could pat ourselves on the back when we grew the kingdom of God. When God says, no, if you love me with all your heart and you want to grow my kingdom, then love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. Forgive those who persecute you. Consider it pure joy when you face trouble. Do these simple things that I'm asking you to do and watch my kingdom come. But so many of us are like, oh, I'm, we're going to do, do more studies. We're going to do more, more studies and more programming and more things because we're going to grow God's kingdom. And God's like, ah, I really wish you would just listen to me. And then you see Uzzah gets smited. He gets killed by God. I need to see you pause real quick, and I need to talk about this because I'm, I'm watching a generational shift happen before me. When I grew up and started going to church, so I'm a child of the 80s. I started going to church in the late 90s. And, and when I was going to church, man, people loved some turn and burn sermons back then. People love sermons when pastors walk out on stage and be like, you're all sinners, and God's gonna kill every single one of you unless you repent, amen. And he walks off, right? In fact, there was like a real famous sermon called uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And like that was like the vibe back then. It was like God is an authority figure. Respect him or die. And people were like, I love it so much. <laughs> Boomers and Gen Xers are weird. Okay, anyway, so uh, we're masochistic if nothing else. We're just like, we like that. What I'm watching is a shift in this. Millennials and Gen Z, uh, the wrath of God is a real problem for them. Parents of, of millennials and Gen Z, you, know, you need to realize this. The wrath of God is a problem for these people. How could a loving God be mean? Why would a loving God kill someone? That just seems so, why can't he be nice? I thought God loved me. I thought God, Jesus loves me. And let me, so let me just try to explain this to you because God's not wrong for having wrath. Um, this, is a, this is not a complete illustration, but it's the best one that I could reason through and I could come up with you, um, for you. Uh, God is the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We interact with God in two different covenants. And you need to know this when you're studying scripture and you're reading scripture. The old covenant, God don't play. God says jump, you say how high. God says put the, carry the ark on a pole, do not dare put that on a cart. And the old covenant, what God says goes. And when you mess up, there are strict consequences immediately. Plagues, famine, sickness, death. Immediate Bold correction whenever you don't do what your heavenly father says. But then what happens to Jesus is we get this new covenant with God and we get this new way to interact with God and we get this thing called grace. And now with grace, we still make mistakes. We still make the same mistakes we used to, but now God doesn't say, you know, pestilence and famine and, and plagues and, and death. 
God says, <laughs> my son's sacrifice is sufficient for your sin. I will give you a second chance, a third chance, an eighth chance, a fortieth chance. Because I am not, I am not um, slow in bringing my justice, but I am patient, wanting everyone to repent and no one to perish. So God is more patient, but he is the same God. So here's the illustration I have for you, and I, I think about like, parenting. When, when I was raising my daughters as young women, when they were young girls, right, I, I'm, I'm not here to reason with a four-year-old. Don't touch the stove. Why not? I don't care because I said so. Do not touch the stove. Do not go across the street. I just gave them hard rules, and I'm not reasoning with you. I'm not explaining them. Like, this is not the job. You, your job is just to obey me because I love you, and I want to keep you safe. Now, as my children are getting older, they're now in middle school, high school, but I have peers of mine who are now parenting adult children. And those of you who are in that journey of life where you're parenting adult children, you realize you no longer get to say, because I said so. Now you got to watch with a heavy heart your child make mistakes. And you don't have the authority to correct them anymore. All you have is just truth to tell them and grace to give them when they want to come back. And that's all you can do. And so, so, so God is the same. You're the same parent. You love your child. You love that little child the same way. That you, you were strict on them and you gave them immediate consequences because you wanted to get them on the right path and that was out of love. And then you, you, you allow, you, you, you give your, your adult child the, the, the freedom they have as an adult, but you love them the exact same. You want to see them on the right path the exact same. You just, the way you interact with them is differently. That's not a complete accurate illustration, but if that helps you understand how God was so strict and wrathful in the Old Testament and why he has grace in the New, that's kind of what's happening here. And so, and so what we see is we see the, 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 the ark's coming in and Uzzah dies because it's on the cart. He's touching it. There's so many things going wrong. And God's like, no, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Now look at this very next verse. I love that this is in here because I love that the scripture, when you read it, you see the humanity of human beings on the hearts of these pages. The very next verse, verse 8, says, Then David, after Uzzah dies, David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was angry at God. Here's what I love that verse. Here's why I love that verse. You're allowed to be angry at God. You're allowed to emote to God. You can shake your fist at him. You can yell at him. You can say whatever word you want to say in your head, not out loud. You can be genuine with God. And you can be genuinely upset when he's correcting you, when he's disciplining you. You can be genuinely upset when you don't feel like things are going your way. You're allowed to be angry at God. He doesn't take it personal. He loves you. He's going to let you throw a fit. He's going to let you exhaust yourself hitting his chest in anger. And then when you collapse, he's going to scoop you up in his arms and he's going to say, I know it's frustrating, but I love you. You know, think about my daughters. Not often, but there's been a couple times where my daughters have been angry at me. Dad, you are a murderer of fun. That's not literally what they sound like, but in my head, that's what they sound like, you know? There's been times they're mad at me. I can take it. I'm not offended. I love you, and I'm disciplining you for your own good. Well, then I'm not going to be your friend. It's okay. I got friends. I'm an adult, okay? Like, just, I didn't get this far in life without moving before you without friends, okay? Anyway, I'm not threatened by their anger. I'm not threatened by their fits. I let it happen, let them exhaust themselves, and then I remind them their truth. I'm doing this because I love you. You're allowed to be angry at God. You're allowed to emote to God. God, I, why did you allow cancer to happen in this world? Why did you let that thing happen? Why didn't I get this raise? Why did this thing happen? Like You're allowed to be honest with God, really honest. And if you don't believe me, read the Psalms. Then right smack down in the middle of the Bible, the book of Psalms, you see most of them written by David. Him just being angry at God or sad and depressed or, or, or jubilant and, and, and joyful. And, and you watch, read these Psalms. It's just all over the place because these Psalms are humans emoting to God. And we are all over the place. 
That's why you can have Psalm 23, which says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And he lies me behind green pastures. And, and, like, and it's just like God's with me so much. But literally, one Psalm before that is Psalm 22, where David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're, my enemies surround me. They devour me like lions. It's the same God doing the same thing. What's different is David's perspective in the moment he's writing those Psalms. He is a human being emoting. And you're allowed to do that because God gave you emotions. He's not offended when you're mad. He's not offended when you bang your fist on his chest, when you call him out and you choose him. He's just going to let you throw your fit and he's going to remind you the truth. I'm doing this because I love you. I know you have the good intentions, but you're not listening to my way and you're going to harm more people. I need to correct you. So I'm changing these things. You and I have to get better at receiving correction. Because what we do oftentimes is what David does is we run. Look at this next verse, verse 10, uh, verse 9, it goes on. It says, you know, so David's angry at God. And I think it's totally fine he's angry at God because look at this next verse. It says, David was afraid of the Lord. He's angry at him, but he still fears his power. He still fears his authority. He still honors God in that way. But look what happens. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to, uh, come to me? He was not willing to take the ark to the, of the Lord to be with the, him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And look at this. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. David did what so many of us do. David had a good heart. I'm going to bring this Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, into my city. And I'm not going to do it the way God wants to because that's not cool enough. I'm going to do it a better way with, with wheels and it's going to be it's a whole new technology. It's going to be awesome. And, and I'm going to bring it in. And, and, then, and then God says, no, 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 no. I got to correct this. You're doing it wrong. And David's like, I don't like that. I don't like you correcting me when my heart was pure and I'm doing something better than you even told me to do it. Why are you correcting me? I'm good. In fact, you know what? I don't even want you around. I'm leaving the ark here. I'm leaving at obed Edom's house. I'm moving on. I'm done. I cannot tell you as a pastor how many times I see this. How many times I see people, people come to church services, people come you know, seeking a relationship with God, and usually what, what, what brings people to a church service for the very first time, usually some kind of eternal, internal crisis, an addiction out of control, a relationship that's falling apart, um, so, you know, some kind of you know, uh, problem in life. And people are coming, looking for answers, looking for hope, looking for a God to put them on a path. And, and what I usually see is God starts to like speak to them. He starts to heal those things. And people get like really jazzed. Like, oh, church works. Like God's real. And he's really like, he's, it's awesome. And he's doing this thing in my life and he's changing it. And then like that. And then what happens is God doesn't stop. Usually we come to God like, hey, fix my marriage. It's like, okay, I'm gonna start working on that. Or he's like, fix my sobriety. It's like, I'm gonna start working on that. And then we start to make progress in those things. And then God's like, oh yeah, and by the way, I also want to fix your greed. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't ask you to talk about greed. I asked you just to talk about addiction, please. I only want to hear addiction sermons. And God's like, mm, yeah, but no. God's like, I want to fix everything in you. So God doesn't stop. He just keeps correcting, keeps correcting, keeps correcting. And sometimes we go, I don't like that. I don't like you rebuking me. I don't like you correcting me. I don't like you allowing me to go to heart, through hardships because of my decisions. I don't like you making me aware of my sin. And so then what we say, well, then I'm, just, I'm, I'm done with church. I'm done. Those people are just trying to control me. Those people, oh, I don't like them. And we walk away. But notice what happens. He leaves the ark in Obed-Edom's house. And look what happens. Obed-Edom's house gets the blessing. That ark was supposed to be in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was supposed to be getting the blessing. But they said, no, I'm going to leave it here. And then God said, okay, leave it here. I'll bless here. I'll bless whoever is in my presence. And if you want to remove yourself from my presence, then you're going to remove yourself from my blessing. And that's a you problem. Because I have told you, draw near to me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Come near to me, and I will draw near to you. And so... And so what I see too many times is, is people come to church with an issue and God starts to work on the issue in life. They like that, but then God starts meddling in some other issues in their life. And they, I don't want that. And they leave the church. But here's the thing. God's blessing doesn't stop. His kingdom is still coming. And, and if you take yourself out of that, then, then you're going to miss God using you. You're going to miss God transforming you. You're going to miss having the Holy Spirit being empowered in you. You're going to miss the, this adventure that we're on. You're, I'm telling you, you are taking yourself out of, the, out of this journey. 
That if you just stay in the presence of God, even though it's uncomfortable to be in the presence of the ark, and it, 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 it's, it's changing you, and it's, it's uncomfortable, like, like going through like a spiritual puberty, and you're like, I don't like this. You know, like, like, but if you stick through it, God matures you spiritually into the fullness of who he made you to be, that life and life to the full. David left the ark for three months because he was afraid of it. But the blessings kept happening there. And David said, but I want that in Jerusalem. Okay, God, let's do it your way. And look at the solution side of this. It goes back and says, now, verse 12 says, now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything that he has done because of the ark of God. So David went up to bring the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When, look at this, when those who were carrying, it's not on the card anymore, those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps. There's no wheels involved anymore. David said, okay, God, I get it. I get it. I still want the ark in the Jerusalem. I still want that blessing, and I want to do it your way. We're going to get the people we're going to carry by the poles. We're going to walk it there the way you told us to do it. And I love this. It says, after they took six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. It says, because the number seven in Scripture is the number of, of completion. And so he allowed the people to take six steps. He goes, well, stop. Before you take one more step, we're going to worship. We're going to worship, and we're going to worship from this point all the way into Jerusalem. We're going to start with a sacrifice, and then we're going to get this party popping. And look what it says, verse 14. It says, then wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And while he, while he and all of Israel were bringing the ark of the Lord with shouts and with sounds of trumpets. So now he is dancing in his linen ephod. What you just need to know is, linen ephod is an, a linen ephod is an undergarment. They would have a heavy outer robe, and they would take that off, and like basically, it's their underwear, okay? It's a long kind of pajama shirt kind of thing. It's made of linen. It's really, really thin, and you can imagine in a linen, long, kind of drapey, boxy kind of piece of cloth that when you're outside in, in the noonday sun, and that sunlight is shining through, and there's some shadows happening, you can imagine... And then David's out there, like, dancing like this, you know, and he's like... like, like but this is the scene. He's like, I don't, I'm doing it God's way now. We're carrying it, and we're worshiping, and I, I'm laying down my ego. David did not give up on himself. Please, Agape City, do not let failure keep you from worshiping the Lord. Do not let failure keep you from being used by the Lord. Do not let failure keep you from taking your life back. Get back up. Get into the word and try to do what he says to do. One of my favorite reminders of the, of the, of the, of the, the call to get back up is um, that, that, yellow, that, that blue and yellow can uh, of a product that you can get like at, you know, at hardware stores and whatever, WD-40. You know what I'm talking about, WD-40? First off, do you know that's not a lubricant? You should know that. I did not know that until like a month ago. You should know that. It's not a lubricant. WD and WD-40, it stands for water displacement. So, like, it's, it's supposed to get, like, water out of stuff. It's supposed to make stuff, like, waterproof water. You know, put me in. So, I don't, know, I don't know how to use it. Talk to a carpenter. Anyway, so, <laughs> a mechanic? I don't know who uses WD-40. Anyway, but it's water displacement. But I love that it's WD-40. I love that they kept 40 in the name. Do you know why it's WD-40? WD, water displacement. 40 is because this is the 40th try. This is the 40th formula of them trying to make this product. Because WD-1 did not go good. WD-2, somebody died. I don't know. <laughs> WD-3, 4, 5, failures. WD-15, 16, 18, 24, abject failure. WD-38, failure. WD-39, failure. And they said, let's give it one more go. And then we get WD-40. If you fail, it is not the end. God is not giving up on you. But you do have to get back up and try again. And don't try it your way. Try it God's way and see if that doesn't work. 
I gotta go this next half really fast here. The, the ark is coming into the city. David's dancing in his linen ephod. He's doing it right. He's sacrificed. He's worshiping. They're carrying it. It's, he's crushing it. He's literally seeing God's presence coming into his holy city. He is, and God's using him now, and he's loving the ministry he's doing. He's loving the relationship with God he has, and he is just in the zone. It goes on, verse 16. It says, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, watched him from the window, and when he saw all David's leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Now, here's what I got to say about this. It's interesting. It says, McCall, the daughter of Saul. You know who McCall also is? The wife of David. That's David's wife. But the scripture doesn't refer to her as David's wife. She, scripture refers to her as the daughter of Saul. Because she's watching him dance and she's like, ugh, that's not what a king would do. My dad was a real king. My dad was strong and my dad was regal. My dad was a king of authority. You're dancing in your underwear like a fool. And so she despises him in her heart. It goes on, verse 17, it says, They brought the ark of the Lord, and they set it in the place inside the tent, and that David had uh, pitched for, uh, for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave loaves of bread, he gave cakes of dates, cakes of raisin to each person and the whole crowd of the Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. David is like, he's, he's like, I don't care what you're saying, McCall. I'm bringing it in. I'm partying. I, and I'm starting to give away all my wealth. I'm giving away all my good food. I'm giving my bread. I'm giving my raisin cakes, date cakes. Boom. You get a cake cake. You get a date cake. Everybody gets date cakes. Bah! Like, like David is just having a ball, being generous, being a little irreverent, and just worshiping. Because God is in it, and he's being glorified, and he's moving. And McCall hates it. She hates it. She cannot let it go. Verse 20, when David returned home to bless his household, McCall, daughter of Saul, came to him. His wife came to him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. I love it any times there's sarcasm in the Bible, because I'm a very sarcastic person. How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of those slave girls and of every servant as any vulgar fellow would. You kind of see the motive of why McCall is kind of not in a good mood. You know, she's a little jelly. Like them slave girls looking at my man. Mm -mm. And she calls David out for it. And she shames him for it. But that's what scripture keeps reminding us. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness. Blessed are you when, 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 don't let when people look down on you for doing good. There's gonna be times when we're gonna look foolish because we're following God. We're doing it God's way. We're gonna look foolish when we're loving our neighbor and they're like, why are you bringing me cookies? We're gonna look foolish when we try to forgive our enemies. And they're like, nobody forgives. We, we, we do this to the mortal end. Why, why are you trying to ask for forgiveness? That's not how this works. But when you do things God's way, it looks like foolishness to this world. But that's because God wants to get the glory, not you. And so, so we see David, uh, McCall is just like so put off. And David says this, verse 21, David said to McCall, it was before the Lord who chose me. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone in your household to be appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, it was before the Lord that I, will that I will celebrate. I wasn't doing it for these slave girls. I know you're thinking that I'm shaking my, my, my body out here for them. I'm not. I'm worshiping God. I'm focused on God. I was doing this for God. You can accuse me of having bad motives, but that's not true. I love God. God. I'm doing this for God. And, verse 22, and I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. David says, I am, the reason I'm not acting like a king right now, this moment, is because I'm in the presence of a real king right now in this moment. 
And so I don't wear royal robes because he deserves all royalty. I don't act like I'm the one in charge because he is the one in charge. I just worship him. And if you think that's foolish, that's fine. You could call it foolish because he's the king and I'm not. And if you think I'm being undignified, just wait. Because I will be even more undignified than this because I am doing this for the glory of God. And then the whole chapter culminates with this last verse. It says, And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death the odd fact to put in this account until you realize that God made a promise that through the lineage of David he would bring a Messiah and if you read in the book of Matthew the genealogy of Jesus you see that Jesse has a son named David and then David And Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, have a son named Solomon. It's not McCall who passes on the lineage of God. It's not McCall who passes on the genealogy of David that ultimately culminates in Christ. Because of her heart, because of her bitterness, because of her sin, she misses out. And God took the situation that was chaotic and gross and and, and this relationship that started by sin, but these two hearts of David and Bathsheba who were repentant and who wanted to get it right even though they got it wrong. And God gave them another child named Solomon. And Solomon becomes the third king of Israel. Solomon builds the temple. Solomon puts the ark into the Holy of Holies. It is Solomon who passes on the lineage that ultimately culminates in Christ. We want to see the kingdom of God come. We want to see people go to heaven. We got to do it his way. We got to do it his way with good hearts. And if it looks like foolishness to this world, then we got to become even more undignified than this. Because it's not us who get the victory, it is God. I believe 2 Samuel 6 happened, and I believe it's still happening today. And I believe you and I get to interact with this going forward. What is your desire? I know it's good because you're here at church on a Sunday morning. I know your desire is good. But I know you think you have a way that's better than God's way. And you're wrong. Your way leads to death. God's way leads to life eternal. And God's way is fun. So let's give God that honor. And let's trust that he is good And let's allow his kingdom to come the way that he wants it to in us and through us. And Agape City, you have to realize where that begins. That does not begin on a church service on Sunday morning. It begins in your heart, in my heart, in our heart. Are we individually relented to the lordship of Christ and willing to do things his way? Each of us individually. Because if we are, then when we get together collectively, that is where the kingdom of God is and will be felt and will expand. When we take our life back, we become a tool that God can use to bring his kingdom to this world.